All right, Seth Andrews is a former believer of 30 years, including a decade as a Christian radio host, who ultimately discovered that religion lacked any legitimate answers, especially in the bright light of scientific discovery. Instead of being satisfied with the belief system inherited from his family and culture, he found greater satisfaction in thinking for himself and eventually encouraged others to do the same. You know him as the thinking atheist. He produced what we saw earlier, the tribute to Christopher Hitchens. It's a pleasure to introduce Seth Andrews. Seth. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I am not the thinking atheist. I am a uh, former Christian broadcaster raised by theologian parents in the womb of Christianity. I went to a Christian school from fourth through twelfth grade, was a Youth for Christ spokesperson, one of those clean-cut, well-spoken young men that religion loves to cart out in front of audiences and say, what a great example. Uh, I entered uh, radio in 1990 as a Christian broadcaster for over a decade, and I'll spare you the long story, but it was a series of events that started to not jive in my head as to whether or not I could reconcile my faith with the facts. Then I checked out for almost a decade. You know, you just, you just say, ah, whatever. I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. There is a God. I don't go to church. Uh, you just check out. And finally, I don't know if there's something magical about the age of 40, but as I approached it, I realized I really want to know what is true and what is not, and I discovered a certain Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Charles Templeton, Sam Harris, and many, many others, and before you know it, the answers I was getting there, much, much better than what I had been taught. My family remains de devotely religious, and they believe I am going through the worst midlife crisis in the history <laughs> of midlife crises. Three years ago, almost, as a therapy, I started the website thethinkingatheist.com. And I didn't do it because I am the thinking atheist. The thinking atheist is an icon. It's, a, it's an icon of a man with a, or a human with a, with a light bulb in it. And, and what it is is we should all be thinking. It, it was only when I started thinking for myself and I didn't inherit someone else's worldview, but I started adding it up and deciding what skin am I comfortable in that I realized that I am a non-believer in any deity. And I wanted to encourage others to do the same. So if you hear any hubris in the thinking atheist, it's really a concept. It's an idea. It's a, it's a hope that all of us would be thinking. And those of us who say, well, isn't the thinking atheist redundant? I'm like, hell no. <laughs> we have all met people who are not believers in a deity who are just as dull as a sack of wet mice, haven't we? <laughs> Jeez. I want to uh, thank Bill for allowing me to be a part of today, I, I looked at the program, all these pedigreed, educated people, PhDs and, you know, biologists, geologists, theoretical physicists, and me, and I feel like this is the rodeo and I am the clown. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I mean, when I get back to the States, I'm going to milk it for all it's worth. If somebody walks up and they say, hey, do you do you, know, uh, do you know Lawrence Krauss? I'm going to be like, what, Larry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also want to thank Bill for customizing the menu uh, for this occasion. That, that <laughs> was absolutely delicious. <laughs> I make light of the stereotypes that atheists so often face. Uh, I'll be honest, the, the Thinking Atheist website started in 2009. My head, after only three years, hurts from the stereotypes, the nonstop barrage of assumptions and accusations and inaccuracies, these long emails I get, uh, the comment sections. If there is a hell, it is the YouTube comments section. <laughs> The forum posts, the drive-bys on Facebook. Anybody have religious people who do those Facebook drive-bys? Bless your heart, I'll pray for you. The verbal exchanges, it's all the same stuff. Recognize the guy on the far right? That is me in 1995. Look at that fresh face. Uh, that is not a mullet, it is a bi-level. 
Business in the front, party in the back. <laughs> Posing with a group called the Imperials, they were huge in Christian music in late 70s and throughout the 80s. And there's Amy Grant. That definitely is a mullet. <laughs> That's got to be about 95 or 96. I did radio for a lot of years, folks. And on both sides of the dial, I remember when I would hear a song for the first time. It was interesting. It was catchy. I enjoyed it. I'd say, hey, to my friends, did you hear that song? Check it out. Turn it up. And the radio station would play that song week after week after week. Do they do that here? After week after week until the greatest hits became, well, the greatest shits. <laughs> and the song comes on the radio and you go, oh, click, right? You're out. A recent example for me was the song by Adele, Someone Like You. You guys know the song? What a rich, beautiful voice, something I hadn't heard anything quite like it before. I thought, well, I enjoyed that. And then the Chinese water torture of corporate radio took that song and hammered it over and over and over and over and over until I would hear the first 10 seconds of that song on the air and I would physically utter the words, please kill me. <laughs> Ever feel that? Click. Q102 FM, 75 degrees today on our way to a high of 92. Chance of showers by the weekend. And coming up next, it's Adele and someone like you on Q102. Ugh. <laughs> Click. That is exactly how I feel about the broken records of religious arguments that I hear every single day, folks. I mean, they were interesting the first few dozen times. They've been played to death. They weren't that interesting to begin with. Q102 FM, 75 degrees on our way to a high of 92 chances showers by the weekend. Coming up next, it's Ken Ham's classic hit, My Granddaddy Wasn't No Monkey. <laughs> Followed by Evolution, It's Just a Theory. God of the gaps, it takes more faith to be an atheist. Teach the controversy. You were never a true Christian to begin with. You took it out of context. I had a personal experience. I'd rather believe in God and be wrong than not believe and be right. There's little Blaze, Blaze Pascal. How did something come from nothing? The eye is too complex to have evolved. Scientist X believes in God. Look, folks, we found one. <laughs> I'll quote the Bible to prove the Bible. All belief systems deserve respect. Why can't we all just get along? America is a Christian nation. On a mountain in Turkey, they recently discovered Noah's Ark. Again! <laughs> there are no atheists in foxholes. The Bible wouldn't have been true if it been around so long. It's got to be accurate. Look at all the copies that have been printed. Most popular book ever written. Oh, ignore the Old Testament and read the New. Anybody hear that one? <laughs> if you don't believe in God, where do you get your morals from? With a special bonus track, Hitler... You've killed God because you wish to be God. It's not a religion, folks. It's a relationship. <laughs> Darwin had a deathbed conversion, didn't you hear? My sister had a supernatural experience on the operating table. She floated above her body. She was clinically dead for 12 minutes, and she heard every word the doctor said, and you can't prove to me that that did not happen. Has anybody heard a friend or relative say something like that? There are no transitional fossils. Prove God 
doesn't exist. Why are you stealing my joy? For someone who doesn't believe in a God, you sure do talk about him a lot. And a personal favorite, you got to help me with this one. You may not believe in him, but he coming up next on Q102. <laughs> That's why I only do one show a day, folks. It's numbing. I mean, for me anyway, it's exhausting to see arguments long ago refuted. But each person that, that calls a podcast or emails me or catches me on the street acts like they are saying something new. It's the information age. It's become so much easier to find and understand the answers to these arguments. And that's part of what is so frustrating for me. I mean, the answers are almost always findable, or at least the best answers we have for anyone who cares to look. And our modern age has made it possible. Now, just a few decades ago, information wasn't really held hostage. It was just a hell of a lot harder to get. Real quick, how many of you graduated high school in 1990 or before? Are you brave enough to raise a hand? For the younger demographic in the room who may not know what I'm talking about, I would like to invite you to take a journey with us. We're going to step into my way back machine and explore the, uh, the bleeding edge technology of yesterday. Anybody know what this is? This is what cable television looked like in 1984. The state-of-the-art channel changer, folks, is hardwired by your cable technician to the wall. Don't worry, there's 30 feet of actual cable. So you can stand up, look into the kitchen, walk over here, answer the phone, handy-dandy box, it sits right on your lap. Three clickable rows of 12 channels each, a total of 36 channels. That's 36 channels, folks, all at the touch of a large plastic button, unless you decide not to subscribe to the premium channels. Now, to my knowledge, the Playboy channel was never actually subscribed to because teenage boys would stare at the scrambled signal for days, <laughs> waiting for a few precious moments of recognizable human skin. I don't know this from experience, it's just what I heard. By the way, even back then, there were men and women who preferred satellite over cable. Woo! <laughs> Television plucked from the sky boggles the mind. Of course, you might be too busy to watch television, especially with the newfound popularity of the personal computer. Anybody know what this is? You just gave yourself away. This is the Radio Shack TRS-80, originally released in 1977. This baby boasts a 12-inch Monochrome monitor, cassette storage for loading and saving programs. By the way, loading a program would often take like 45 minutes, and you had to listen to that. A lightning-fast processor speed of 1.77 megahertz and a whopping 4K of RAM. 4K. Software options were awesome. They included Math 1, Level 1 Basic, and Home Recipe. <laughs> now, it's a portable computer, which is why you want this handy carrying case. <laughs> now, if still images are your thing, folks, nothing beats the Kodak Instamatic. I had one. Come on, own up to it. Who had one of these? Popular just a few decades ago, the Kodak Instamatic featured fixed focus, a flash range of four to nine feet, and a viewfinder that is essentially a piece of glass. For indoor photography, you could attach the flash cube. Four whole pictures out of every stinking cube. It flashes, turns 90 degrees, flashes, turns 90 degrees. When you're done with four, you pop it off, and I think they sold them in packs of four. Of course, when you're done, you can take them by the nearest photo mat location. They say one, do, one day photo service. I remember it being more like three to five days. I think it was depending on what you paid. Look back just a few decades ago and think about how quaint our once cherished advancements 
now look and feel. Things like cell phones. <laughs> Anybody have a bag phone? The battery was bigger than the phone, remember? And you had the big magnetic antenna that's clipped to the top of the car. Portable music on your Sony Walkman. 45 minutes of music on it. You could find 120-minute cassettes. They were so thin, you might get three or four plays out of them before they snapped or melted. <laughs> Speaking of cassettes, I saw this floating around the internet. I just thought it was funny. It's an age test. <laughs> Anybody know the connection between these two audi the objects? <laughs> Anybody remember how hard it used to be to get show times for the movies, right? Hey, honey, you want to go to a movie tonight? And she says, yeah, I don't know, what's out? You get in the car, you drive to the store, you buy a newspaper, you bring it home, you flip to the entertainment section, you find the movies, read the show times. This was before you decided if you wanted to go for sure. Here's a classic newspaper listing I found back from 79, uh, Star Trek. It's a, a, an ad, actual ad in the paper. Here's one from Back to the Future 3. Anybody remember when you had to cook a potato in the oven and it took forever before they had microwaves with a potato button? <laughs> you just hit the potato button. Some of them have a picture. <laughs> Researching a term paper, an article, a thesis, a book, whatever. Back in the day, you get in the car, you drive to the downtown library, you park at the meter, you go inside, you talk to the librarian, you use the Dewey Decimal System, you scan the microfiche, you pour through these huge sections filled with thousands of books to find the ones you needed or thought you needed, spent countless dimes, or whatever your money is in Canada, on the Xerox machine. Filling your arms with all your research, check out, you go back in the car, you drive all the way home before you realize you forgot a critical piece and you have to go back to the library. Just a few decades ago, getting information often meant running an obstacle course for each and every answer to each and every question. You could find what you needed if you had hours or days and lots and lots and lots of patients, but science books and history books and peer reviews and medical journals and the lion's share of research-related information was mostly out there somewhere, often difficult to find, often difficult to get, often cumbersome and difficult to manage. It was like cookies in the cookie jar. You could get there, but it was out of a reasonable reaching distance, and you had to do a lot of climbing. So when somebody came along who said they were an authority on any given subject, we might have been somewhat dubious, but if they were credentialed and they came with a marquee name, we often nodded and said, well, you know, wow, he's got a PhD from Liberty University. <laughs> he must be an expert. He must know his stuff. Anybody here play Scrabble? Anyone remember back before smartphones and Google when you played Scrabble with an actual Webster's Dictionary or a Merriam-Webster Dictionary sitting on the table with you? You had to play with a dictionary. Your opponent, it's, it's, it's near the end of the game. Your opponent plays something with a Z and a Q on a triple word score, right? And you look at them and you go, that's not a word. It's an illegal move, but you don't have the resource to prove it. You fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. All right, fine. You win. Pull that today and see what happens. We live in an era where you can play Scrabble in outer frickin' space. Talk about access to information. Today, by the way, our cell phones have more computing power than all of NASA used to send men to the moon in 1969. The Sony PlayStation today is more powerful than the multi-million dollar military supercomputer of 1997. Our cameras need no film and they store hundreds, perhaps thousands of images. Our trains float in the air on electromagnets. She had the best line. I'm not even going there. So. 
When I started in uh, video, I'm a vid professional video producer, have been for almost a decade. I segued from radio to video. When I started, standard definition broadcast video was recorded on these. Anybody come from video and remember these? Beta SP tapes, big old honking, jacked up, crazy, huge, cumbersome tapes that stored 90 minutes of 720 by 480 SD analog video. Now you can score, store hours of high definition video on that. Unbelievable. If you told us 10 years ago, we'd have said you were nuts. An encyclopedia of knowledge. Used to be a long, heavy, cumbersome row of books. Anybody subscribe to that? My parents had one. Huge, big, long. It took up the whole row. You got to go find the W's, and then you run going through it, remember? Updated them every few years, and they were not cheap. Hundreds of books, thousands of pages. Now, it's an app on your cell phone. We can fit entire libraries on e-book readers smaller than a single file folder. Presentations from our planet's greatest minds. <laughs> Presentations from our planet's greatest minds used to remain mostly hidden inside universities and lecture halls. But now, thanks to YouTube and services like it, the whole world is the lecture hall. We can all be in the audience. We can all attend. Information, education, answers, discussion, debate, documentation, soft theories, hard evidence are just a few keystrokes in a few minutes or maybe seconds away. Now, sure, there are different planes of knowledge and understanding, many of which are the domain of the expert, the career scientist, the PhD in, say, theoretical physics or biology or whatever. But those of us outside of those areas are no longer excluded from the discussion. We have the opportunity to learn and absorb and participate in ways never before possible. Relevant, credible, peer-reviewed documentation is out there for anybody who cares to look. We don't have an excuse. We have no excuse, none, for not doing our homework, for digging deeper, for checking the facts, checking the figures, which makes it monumentally frustrating when people make claims without checking, like Albert Einstein, was a Christian. Wrong. Einstein himself said it was, of course, a lie, what you read about my religious convictions, a lie which is being systematically repeated. I do not believe in a personal God. I've never denied this, but have expressed it clearly. The Shroud of Turin could not have been a fake. Wrong. And radiocarbon dating of the original shroud actually places it uh, like 1,000 years, 1,200 years after the supposed death of Jesus Christ. By the way, you can now use the shroud as a, a tasteful bedroom motif. <laughs> kind of a... <laughs> carbon dating doesn't work. Wrong. There's carbon dating right there. I spared you the carbon copulation photo that I was going to put on it. Would, it, would that have produced a diamond? <laughs> Security. So, <laughs> carbon dating works if you use it correctly. Look, I'm a civilian in a room with scientists who do this for a living, and yet, and you guys correct me because that's what science does, but as I understand it, it works if you understand it and use it the way it should be used. Radiocarbon dating doesn't work on objects much older than 20,000 years-ish because such objects have no, so little C14 left in them. You can't use it on things like coal and diamonds because decaying uranium deep in the underground affects the samples. Carbon dating works on organic material in the upper sedimentary layers. Obviously, with a limit of 20,000 years, if an apologist comes forward and said you can't... It incorrectly dated a fossil. Well, of course, you can't use it on fossils. Potholer54 on YouTube has a very interesting video that explains carbon dating, and I like it because it's civilian-friendly. People stupid as me can, can watch it and digest information and then go and, of course, verify and fact-check. But it's called The Age of Our World Made Easy. If you get a chance, I recommend it. It's good stuff. There are no transitional fossils like these, you mean? Wrong. 
not only have researchers found transitional fossils, they've discovered there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of them. I recommend the book by geologist uh, Donald Prothero. It's called Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters. He's also got a great speech on YouTube. I think it's of the same name. You can just look it up. It's free. Free. I've sent it to I don't know how many religious people. You know how much they watched? About 10 minutes. Well, whatever. God is love. <laughs> I'm not interested. The Grand Canyon was created 4,000 years ago by Noah's flood. Has anybody heard this one? Yeah. Wrong. But take heart, believers, you're only wrong by hundreds of millions of years. <laughs> Folks, your bullshit meter just may need adjustment. They forward Photoshop masterpieces like this one. <laughs> <laughs> thinking they're real. I see this all over Facebook. This is just another reminder of how much God loves all of us and has us in his embrace. Here's the original photo. I found it on Snopes.com. Took me about 90 seconds to find the real thing, right? What it tells us is that they're not looking. Here's a perfect example of a religious claim embraced by thousands that could have been totally avoided with a quick fact check. Anybody remember when the Christian community freaked out because they heard Procter & Gamble was giving money to the Church of Satan? Did that make it up here to Canada? The story goes like this. Now, for those of you who don't know, Procter & Gamble makes pretty much everything. Everything from uh, Old Spice deodorant to Crest toothpaste, Vicks cough drops, Pampers diapers, they're huge, right? The story goes that the president of Procter & Gamble, I think this was in the 80s sometime, appeared on the Donahue talk show and announced he was a Satanist and his company donated a large portion of P&G profits to the Church of Satan. Christians claimed that this logo, which was the Procter & Gamble logo of the time, a half moon, 13 stars, proof of evil, as the circles in the man's beard and connecting the stars correctly revealed the number of the beast, 666, as noted in the, in the book of Revelation. The company got thousands of phone calls every month from angry customers. Thousands boycotted Procter & Gamble products outright, refusing to buy anything, refusing to support the work of Satan. There was an uproar about this corporate giant, which was just a front for Beelzebub's vile agenda and most certainly a sign of the end times. Just a little homework, just a couple phone calls, would have revealed that that logo isn't satanic. It was created by a, by a dock worker in 1851. It was a time when literacy was low. And they identified shipping crates with symbols because many could not read. The 13 stars are said to commemorate the 13 original colonies of the United States. The moon man was just a popular decoration of the time. And even a tertiary look at Procter & Gamble's finances, a company traded on the New York Stock Exchange, would have revealed the funneling of millions of dollars to the Church of Satan, right? But the mind of the Christian community was made up. It just feels right. That looks evil. And this bogus story has been passed around for decades. Here in the year 2012, with all of the information at our disposal including the ability to examine our own genome, we still have to refute the claims that there is no evidence for evolution by natural selection. Does anybody remember, did you guys get it here, the 2011 Miss USA beauty pageant? The contestants were asked whether evolution should be taught in schools. You know where I'm going, don't you? The answers included priceless gems like no, evolution, I do not believe in evolution. I do not think it should be taught in schools, and I would not encourage it. That was Miss Alabama. Miss Oregon, I think that every theory of how we came to be here should get a shout-out in the education. <laughs> Miss Virginia, I think little bits and pieces of evolution should be taught in schools because it is a theory. After all, we need to know about different theories so that we can figure out what we want to believe is true. <laughs> My personal favorite, Miss Indiana, I don't know. I think that's just, I think we should leave that up to the government. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, this was ripe for parody, right? There's a brilliant video on YouTube. I got permission from the producer, Mackenzie Fagan, to show you this two-minute clip. A clever send-up of the Miss USA Evolution video, and it, it draws a bright, brilliant circle around uh, the insanity of removing evidence-based studies from our science classrooms. Take a look. Math? No. <laughs> I do not believe in math, and I don't think we should encourage it. Um, ooh. I... Oh, okay, this is a really hard one. Um, there are really two sides to this story. On the one hand, you have math, and then on the other hand, you have... This is like non-math. All seven-year-olds should have the right to decide for themselves if math is scientific fact. Math is a theory, and it's... It's not at all what the Bible tells us. We live in America, not Russia. Just a little bit. Adding, not um, the uh, times. I think that people should try to be as knowledge as they can. I think they need to get learned so that, you know, they can make a choice about all of the world things. Children have the right to learn anything they want to learn. Um, alchemy, psychology. <laughs> gymnastics. You really don't know what the square root of 16 is. No one does. Francis Collins, himself an evangelical Christian founder of the Human Genome Project, has admitted evolution must be true. One of the captains of the religious team just admitted that Darwin's playbook is the one that works. Side note, Francis Collins just re refuted his own supposedly perfect Bible. 10,000 people at the moment of creation, no Adam and Eve, no original sin, no need for the uh, flood of Noah, no need for Jesus to come and be crucified, no need for the resurrection. Everything built on that foundation crumbles. Francis Collins just refuted his own Bible. But still, we have to hear and refute time after time the arguments against evolution and for intelligent design. The arguments that our modern scientific methods are not reliable, but a 2,000-year-old anonymously written book is reliable. It's exhausting. Does anybody else know what that feels like? <laughs> Tired, repetitive, unoriginal arguments that are like those songs on the radio. They play day after day after hour after hour, and we beg them, please play something else. But okay, just for a moment, let's explore this particular playlist one more time. Let's turn up the volume so everyone can hear and take Christianity's greatest hits. Let's tally them up and let's count them down. Dear Christian, it does not take more faith to be an atheist because an evidence-based approach to living does not regard intuition, assumption, gut feelings, goosebumps. Hairs on the back of your neck, dreams, visions, premonitions, voices, or wish thinking to be a credible method for determining what is true. There is no context of scripture in which stories of talking donkeys, 900-year-old humans, curses, levitation, flying chariots of fire, floating zoos, demon pigs, and supermen who gain strength from their hair are anything but ridiculous. No context could possibly justify Yahweh's endorsement of slavery, torture, Infanticide, kidnapping, rape, and human sacrifice. If you take a fire insurance position of Pascal's wager and you believe in God just in case, it means you don't really believe and you think God can't tell the difference, which makes him not omniscient but clueless. The eye has clearly evolved, and the various stages of evolved eyes can be observed even today from the earliest stages featuring photosensitive cells to the pinhole eye of the nautilus to the complex eye of the krill. Charles Darwin himself spent three pages discussing how the eye could evolve. There are two terrific short videos if you're interested on YouTube. Uh, one is from Sir David Attenborough. It's called The Evolution of the Eye. Same title for Richard Dawkins. He actually has a version I think he did in the 70s and a new one that was produced in 2010. They're really good at explaining in layman's terms how the eye could have evolved how it makes sense. 
If you think there are no atheists in foxholes, you must not know the story of one of the most famous, the story of American hero Pat Tilton. He volunteered for duty, served his country, was a non-believer till the day he died. I also get podcast calls from military servicemen and women from all over the world, and they did not accept God when they went into the battlefield. In fact, the stories I hear is that they were, they were reaffirmed that they were good to reject it outright. For the record, the New Testament does not invalidate the Old Testament. It affirms it in Christ's own words. In Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Jesus himself said it. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Look at Luke 16. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than the smallest part of the letter of the law to become invalid. Besides, if the Old Testament isn't relevant any longer and the Bible is God's instruction book for living, why doesn't he update the damn thing and release Bible 2.0? <laughs> Think about it. If you were a parent and life and death were in the balance and you were communicating rescue instructions to your children by letter or whatever, you would do whatever it took to make sure the right message got through. Whatever it took. Who wrote your Bible? Why even now must you have to ask even rudimentary questions like, who wrote the book of Genesis? Put a hundred apologists in a room and ask them who wrote each individual book of the Bible and watch the cat fight. Who wrote Revelation? You know without a doubt who wrote the John Grisham novel you downloaded to your Kindle. But when somebody asks you who wrote Revelation, the best we can come up with is, well, his name is John. Please stop using the word theory in an intellectually dishonest way, religious community. Scientific theories are not wild stories plucked randomly from the ass. They are scientifically accepted general principles supported by evidence and observed facts. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a theory in this context, a scheme or system of ideas or statements held as an explanation or account of a group of facts or phenomena, a hypothesis that has been confirmed or established by observation or experiment, and is propounded or accepted as accounting for the known facts, a statement of what are held to be the general laws, principles, or causes of something known or observed. For your information, folks, all belief systems do not deserve respect. Christians don't respect the Mormons. Mormons don't respect Muslims. Muslims don't respect anybody else. You're not saying you want all belief systems respected. You just want yours respected. By the way, we atheists think it's really cute when you stand on one religious mythology and you point at another religious mythology and go, that's so dumb. <laughs> I take a harder line when it comes to my former faith. Anybody familiar with my page, my videos, my work, my podcast, whatever, knows I, I poke a lot of fun at religion, Jesus and the Bible. And I, I really do believe it when I say I think mockery of religious doctrine is appropriate, sometimes necessary. Look, the superstition that used to control me, limit me, frighten me, stifle me, it's now a punchline. It's under my feet. It is powerless to control me any longer. It's the monster in the closet that used to scare me, but not anymore. I'm liberated from those change, and that's why sometimes you'll see me post the most irreverent things, like the virginal. <laughs> or this slide, Darth Vader's power pales in comparison to that of the Catholic Church. Vader felt like an amateur. Or the Jehovah's Witness door knocker. Nothing can keep them from knocking on your door. It's the little smoky nativity scene. Bacon roof there, you see that? Speaking of nativities, you guys get Top Gear up here? It's the Stig from Top Gear in the manger during the nativity. The last stripper.
There's Disco Jesus, he died for your spins. <laughs> Kung Fu Jesus. There's uh, Jesus reading the God Delusion. I'm sorry, I, I got that out of order. This is actually a video we did on my website. It's a, um, it's a real bad knockoff for Frank Miller, but Jesus is sort of a, a Bruce Lee, uh, Steven Seagal combo, and in our version of the story, when he's betrayed, executed, and comes back to life, he's got a samurai sword and an Uzi, and he just kicks the shit out of everybody. <laughs> and the tagline is, this time, he's going to nail you. So we've got that video on the uh, website. There's uh, Jesus reading the God delusion. Somebody sent me that. I have no idea where it came from. Personal favorite of mine, racing Jesus in a speedboat. Don't bother, the fucker will just get out and run. <laughs> Some poor guy's in a horrible boat accident, and this is his legacy. <laughs> Religious people, do us a favor. Before you send us a hundred emails about the discovery of Noah's Ark, please Google the difference between a wooden ship and a boat-shaped formation of dirt. Has anybody else had this forwarded to them or sent to them? How is this still around? It's dirt. It's not Noah's Ark. America was not founded as a Christian nation, nor were the founding fathers all religious. George Washington never declared himself a Christian. Thomas Paine re rejected religion outright. James Madison spoke out about religious bondage and how it shackles and debilitates the mind. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were at best deists, no allegiance to the Christian God. There is no endorsement of religion, God, theism, or Christianity in the U.S. Constitution. And God we trust was not added on U.S. coins until after the Civil War, not on paper money until 1957. Under God was not added to the U.S. Pledge of Allegiance until 1954. Oh, after almost two full centuries after the country was founded. The American Founding Fathers set up a government separate from any religion on purpose. In Article 11 of the Treaty of Tripoli, signed by John Adams in 1797, you can read it for yourself. Quote, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. They weren't anti-religion. They believed the wall separating them must stand to protect religion and to protect the state. Hitler did not endorse evolution. He practiced eugenics, which stands in opposition to evolution because with evolution, the larger and more dynamic the gene pool, the better. Biologists, forgive my grand oversimplification and crucify me online later if you would like. Um, Hitler banned or burned Darwin's books. He also banned, quote, all writings that ridicule, belittle or besmirch the Christian religion and its institution, faith in God. Hitler was raised Catholic and embraced Christianity. He had ties to the Catholic Church and invoked God in private and in public and even in the book Mein Kampf. Ultimately, admit that your reference to Hitler has nothing to do with atheism. Hitler is a hot button that people use to vilify the opposition. And I'll tell you, atheists are guilty of using Hitler in the same freaking way. Politicians do it. Please stop using Hitler to provoke. Charles Darwin never had a deathbed confession, conversion to Christianity. At the leading of British evangelist Elizabeth Lady Hope, his own children verified that he remained agnostic to the very end. Your personal experience of an encounter is not proof. Perception and reality, they're so often disconnected. There are entire studies done on the subjectivity of the brain and human memory. That's why eyewitness testimony in criminal court cases is so unreliable. What people see and what they think they see is quite often not what really happened. We often see this in court cases. Levin and Kramer's problems and materials on trial advocacy bears this statement, quote, eyewitness testimony is at best evidence of what the witness believes to have occurred. It may or may not tell what actually happened. The familiar problems of perception, of gauging time, speed, height, weight, and accurate identification of persons accused of crime all contribute to making honest testimony something less than completely credible. And if that's not enough, your spiritual experience has been replicated in a lab using magnets. It doesn't work on everybody. I think even Dawkins and Shermer tried it. 
Don't keep a straight face and tell me that the velociraptor hung out with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Don't tell me that an all-powerful, omniscient, omnipotent God needs to wait a while to defeat the devil when he could have done it before the world began and saved billions. Don't tell me it's righteous to condemn flawed humans to torment in the blackest flames forever and ever because God is just and he loves us. Atheists are all immoral, sad, pathetic, rudderless menaces to society. You mean people like this? Marie Curie, physicist and chemist known as the mother, mother of modern physics, legendary author and scientist Isaac Asimov. How about the director of some of this generation's greatest films? He's got another one coming out. Nobel Prize winners. How about the world's greatest advocates for women's rights? about the guy who wrote The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn? Or the Mythbusters? You guys get the Mythbusters up here? <laughs> Look, I'm from Oklahoma. Paved roads and running water are kind of a luxury. <laughs> so, <laughs> These must be degenerates. Low lives, miserable without any redeeming qualities. You want to talk about goodness? How about the work of so many charities and human rights organizations that provide benefit without religion? Amnesty International, Doctors Without Borders, the Foundation Beyond Belief, the American Red Cross, so many others. Look, no deity was required when the Thinking Atheist online community rallied together just last month to raise over $30,000 for charity. Hemley Gonzalez over Responsible Charity. They are a secular organization, by the way, founded by an atheist. He was involved heavily with Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity, and he couldn't stand the abuses. He left to do his own thing. He sent me photos of the water filters they installed in Kolkata, in uh, Indonesia, or in India, rather, uh, just last week, thanks to the generosity and goodwill of religious, non-religious men, women, and teenagers. It was a genuine, genuine act of humanity and goodness, 100% deity-free. I ask... Uh, I asked Natalie if I should show you the next photo, but because I, I, I didn't want it, I really don't want it to be about me, but I, I had to share this. Hemley sent me a, a, this photo. He printed the photograph from my website and gave it to the families that installed the water, they installed the water filters in their homes, and he photographed them holding up my picture, and he sent it to me, and I almost burst into tears like a baby. <laughs> so these are people that you and I will never even meet whose lives have been positively impacted by a community of hundreds and thousands of non-believers, good for the sake of doing good. Finally, stop telling non-believers that they're egotistical when you're the ones that believe hundreds of billions of galaxies exist so that you can be handpicked by an omnipotent deity for a divine mission to receive an eternal reward. God made the universe with you in mind, and we're the cocky ones? <laughs> now more than ever, Certainly more than when I was a believer, I look up around at the universe and I feel a sense of awe. It's not some cheap bumper sticker, feel good look at the pretty stars kind of awe. It's a genuine understanding that, yeah, you know, the universe doesn't really give a shit if I exist or not. But that's okay. I mean, my very existence is part of a story that spans billions of years. And I am alive at a time of fantastic invention and discovery. Think about it. We live in a time where every day millions of people transport themselves to faraway destinations via flying machines miles over our heads traveling hundreds of times faster than a human can walk. We predict weather often days in advance using mechanical eyes that humans hand placed into orbit around the earth. Our TV remotes, our power tools, our phones have no cords. We can emulate a whole orchestra one instrument, a keyboard. We cook our meals with one touch. We put microchips in our pets so if they get lost, we can track them by satellite. <laughs> we prevent pregnancy with one pill. We pay our bills with one click. We experience motion pictures in 3D, creating synthetic cells in our labs. We're playing Scrabble on the space station. Instead of clutching onto the ham-handed explanations, doctrines, solutions, and instructions of those who were essentially feeling their way around in the dark, it is time to realize and embrace the privilege of being alive, 
to see in action the microscope, the telescope, the video camera, the vaccine, the computer, the laser, the x-ray, the spacecraft, and so much more. I'm embarrassed to discover, to, to admit that I only discovered uh, Carl Sagan late in my 30s. Um, he was a punchline when I grew up. They had Cosmos on PBS, but we watched it with our religious parents, and every time he spoke about evolution or what have you, they were always, my family was always there to sort of tell us, well, you know, you got to take that with a grain of salt. And, and they were doing the billions and billions and billions punchline at the time, and, and I totally had checked out. I, I only discovered Carl Sagan when I was 38, six years ago. Well, I've discovered it's never too late to, to discover Carl Sagan. <laughs> <laughs> the guy was a poet. He managed to articulate the wonder and awe of the cosmos in such a natural way that he gave me goosebumps. His pale blue dot was a profound inspiration for me. Inspired by that poem, I wrote and produced a video that might hopefully remind myself and others that today, this hour, right now, this second, is an amazing and awe-inspiring moment to be alive. Now, I produced this video originally in December of 2010. There was one thing about it that I was always dissatisfied with. I was the narrator for that original incarnation. Now, my voice is, is good for, for a lot of types of video, but in my mind, I had always heard someone else, something else, another style. And it bugged me. So, a year and a half later, I had it revoiced. I'm going to share it with you here tonight, and as soon as we're done, I'm going to log on to the YouTube page and we'll release it worldwide. It is called The Center of All Things, and I hope you enjoy. Imagine. Imagine what it was like for those who came before us at the dawn of humankind, when the earth was flat, when the moon and sun were our mother and father, and when the stars were just pinholes in the curtain of the sky, when we drew our history with primitive pictures, when we fashioned our shelters inside the cold rock of the landscape, when a long life was 30 years. When everything we saw was a sign, a flash from the sky meant God was angry. When the earth shook, the spirits were displeased. The floodwaters came and we begged for forgiveness. The volcano erupted, and we appeased it with sacrifices. We suffered sickness and disease, and we called it a curse when loved ones perished, and we called it judgment. Everything was beyond our understanding, mysterious, strange, wondrous, terrifying unknown. Yet somehow we believed that we were the center of all things. And then we began to see our world with new eyes. The moon was a place we would one day visit and leave our footprints in the dust. The sun was a brilliant cascade of helium and hydrogen, a star, a single solitary star among billions of other stars inside a single galaxy, alongside hundreds of billions of other galaxies in a universe born billions of years before us. 
the tempests above us, the fire beneath us. They became explainable, measurable, often foreseeable. Our crude illustrations gave way to rich expressions of picture and verse that ignited the imagination. We built our shelters from wood, mortar, glass, and steel. We discovered living worlds beyond the naked eye, and we inhabited that world to understand and begin to conquer sickness and disease. We began to unlock the code of our very being and discovered the bond we share with all living things. We celebrated long lives of over a hundred years. Our age is a new age of enlightenment. At this very moment, humankind is beginning to grow beyond the childish fears of its infancy, to refuse to be satisfied with unanswered questions, to acknowledge a universe much grander and more wonderful than the superstitions of our ancestors would ever allow, and to understand that even though we occupy a tiny planet inside a vast universe, we are still part of it. We are growing. We are learning, we are achieving, we are evolving. To finally understand that we are not the center of all things. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.